All right, thank you for joining us. Is everybody ready? <laughs> I think you need to fasten your seat belts again. Uh, we've had such an exciting symposium and that uh, continues to be the case. We're gonna make it exciting up to the very last minute if we, very, if we possibly can and I wanna thank you all for coming. We have our time frame that we need to be aware of today, which is uh, to 1.15. So we're gonna ask that uh, comments and questions be uh, succinct and to the point and uh, I think we have a lot of material to cover and we want to thank our distinguished panels for being panel uh, members for being here with us today and what we're going to do at the start is just to start on this end and go down and let everyone uh, introduce themselves and turn off their cell phones he's making an example <laughs> he's telling you how to do <laughs> it <laughs> so, demonstration. thank you <laughs> and uh, Tell a little bit about, just a little bit about, uh, about their presentation and um, of course the theme is uh, the case for a secret space program and today specifically we're going to be talking about the evidence from governmental and non-governmental sources um, on that and uh, first of all we'll start with you Andy. I'm Andrew DiBasciago, I'm a trial lawyer uh, admitted at the federal and state level in the state of Washington. I was a child participant in DARPA's Project Pegasus between 1968 and 72, which pioneered time-space exploration on behalf of the U.S. Uh, executive defense and intelligence communities. As a college student at UCLA in the early 1980s, uh, 1980 to 84, I served in the CIA's Mars Jump Room program, which I'm going to be discussing after this presentation uh, in the Grand Ballroom beginning at 1.15 p.m. Uh, during this panel, I'm going to be um, presenting what I think is persuasive evidence that we have a significant thread of whistleblowers that establish the historicity of the CIA's Mars Jump Room program as an important historical component of the secret space program, indeed an early phase of activity in the secret space program. All right, thank you very much, Michael Sala. Okay. Um, so I, on Friday, I did a Friday night. I did the presentation on the Navy Secret Space Program. Um, tomorrow, I'm doing a workshop on Antarctica and uh, the Secret Space Program down there, and basically tracing how uh, the, the German Breakaway Group established uh, their presence in Antarctica using the uh, German companies that were the ones fulfilling the tenders for the different flying saucer prototypes. So tracing the involvement of companies like uh, Forker Wolf and uh, the Siemens Corporation, Messerschmitt, um, and, and, and how these uh, German companies worked with American companies both prior to the Second World War, during the Second World War, and after the Second World War in Antarctica, and, and how that evolved into what is uh, what Corey describes as the interplanetary corporate conglomerate, which has its headquarters or had its headquarters in Antarctica. And I'll be also relating that to the um, uh, the discoveries of uh, these uh, ancient alien artifacts in Antarctica and uh, why the, um, the the secret space program down there in Antarctica is, is re really putting a lot of effort into uh, researching and finding out how these uh, artifacts might help them uh, further develop their programs. I'm uh, Bill Tompkins, and uh, uh, I was a third-class seaman in the Navy uh, back in 1942. And I got a job as staff to Admiral Rigobata. Come on here. Do you guys understand what happened? Um, actually, uh, these Navy spies, um, one of them came to back, back from Germany and they went directly to uh, the Secretary of the Navy Forstall. They, he told uh, the Secretary of the Navy that what was happening in Germany and had been happening for at least three years was an unbelievable program where the Third Reich and the SS had hundreds of in-mountain underground s factories 
that were all run by slaves. These were actually building two dozen different kinds of Draco reptilian Navy spaceships. They didn't just give them a manual to show them how to make it. They gave them brand new shiny UFO vehicles that were in the uh, in the Navy Space Organizations of the Draco Reptilians. They were training the German Navy personnel to operate these. The plan was to eliminate all of the people that Hitler wanted to eliminate, not just in Germany, but every planet, every country on the planet. Then they were to train uh, the German personnel to operate all of these different kinds of space vehicles that the reptilians were operating and jointly go together with that Navy group and implement the same kind of a programs all over this galaxy. Uh, I'll let other people talk about it. Thank you for letting me be here. Hello, I'm Corey Good. The last couple of years I've been disseminating information on a program called Cosmic Disclosure on Gaia Television. A lot of my information very closely relates to Tompkins and uh, Dr. Saul and I, have, we've both been working on uh, doing Freedom of, of Freedom of Information Act requests to try to get more documentation and further information to, to corroborate what I've been sharing publicly. I'm Richard Dolan. I've been uh, researching this subject for a long time of UFOs and secret space program as well. I've been researching and lecturing on this for a number of years. Um, in my view, there is uh, overwhelming evidence that there is a clandestine secret component to uh, what we are doing in space. Um, I base this on uh, available evidence that is, I would argue, persuasively presented and easily documented and some speculation based on top of that that I think fits. And I'm very happy to acknowledge when I'm speculating. Um, I've argued that there is what we can call a breakaway civilization that probably uses very advanced technology in some areas. I don't know how many areas. And uh, in all likelihood that there's a program that takes us off this planet and goes beyond. How far beyond, I don't know. Um, it's interesting, and I'm sure everyone in this room is aware that uh, I might have a different perspective on this than my colleagues on the tape, on the um, panel here. And um, it's not that I think that everyone else is wrong, and I'm right. I certainly am sure that I'm wrong about a lot of things. Um, but what I would suggest is that we're only best moving forward when we deal with, uh, as a community, with evidence that we can call um, verifiable and uh, that when we take it to the rest of the world, we can defend. So that's a concept we can call falsifiability, which means that uh, it doesn't mean something's false. It means that you can test it to see whether it's true or false. And um, it's been my contention that uh, some of the information presented at this conference um, is not falsifiable and uh, therefore really cannot qualify as actual evidence. Might be true, might not be true. But if I can't test it, if I can't have any opportunity ever to test it, then uh, it really needs to be set aside and we can put it in the gray box. That's my, that'd be my initial statement. All right. Thank you very much, gentlemen. And uh, I think what we're going to do, we're going to need to set up for uh, questions from the audience. Um, we could start out while you're getting a, is there another microphone that you could put there where people, when they want to ask their questions. Uh, and I'm sure, how many of you have a question in mind? Uh-oh. <laughs> I can see. Okay. Now, what we're going to try to do, uh, and they've done a great job uh, of keeping it uh, pretty short and to the point, 
I can guarantee you every one of them could talk about the subject, at least at this point, forever, almost, and would love to, and we would love to hear it, but we're trying to move along and keep on schedule. Um, first of all, let's start with, um, with just the basic question and let each of them answer it just uh, simply before we move on to the audience, and that is basically what is the um, evidence in your, your mind uh, from government and non-governmental non sources that a secret space program is real and has been ongoing. Uh, so if you could uh, talk briefly to that, um, and then we'll go down the line. Well, there's been a lot of discussion of evidence uh, at this conference, and I just want to emphasize that uh, we're there's really two forms of evidence we can talk about. We can talk about scientific evidence, which is verifiable, as Richard stated, just, just stated. That, in fact, is the essence of the scientific, scientific method. Then there's legal evidence, and I would point out as an attorney that legal evidence um, is not a matter of truth or falsity per se, as, at least in terms of how we examine it as a threshold question. The, th the threshold test of admissibility for legal evidence is a determination usually made by the judge as to whether that evidence is potentially probative, meaning tending to prove the point asserted, or prejudicial, tending pr to prejudice um, the, 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 the point asserted. The second dichotomy that we have to remember when we're evaluating the issue of evidence is whether we're talking testimonial evidence, which hangs on what people say happened, or documentary evidence, which is evidence that's been recorded in which some past historical participant, a CIA agent, an FBI special agent, has recorded something. Now I want to emphasize for the benefit of this audience, for the, this, 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 this gathering, that for our purposes in the ufological and exopolitical communities, in my case in the time travel community, and as an experiencer, both of these forms of evidence are important. They're both valued. They both have particular strengths and weaknesses, and to some extent, they're dependent on each other. So for example, if somebody makes an assertion that they participated in a program, I essentially acknowledge Richard's point uh, voiced in his presentation yesterday. I basically agree with the notion that we cannot hang our belief on reality or what we bring to the, the, the larger culture on, on, me, on what the law calls mere assertions on people saying, this happened to me. On the other hand, because these projects were undertaken in secrecy, there's going to be a, a, a residue of, of experiencers who were in bona fide projects. I'm often asked as an experiencer whether I believe that Corey was an actual experiencer, Randy Kramer, you know something? I don't know. What I do know is I have to practice a kind of an objectified open-mindedness and first listen to what the whistleblowers are saying. Why? because we need to gather testimonial evidence as to what happened in these programs. Okay, so th thank you. Now, when we combine that with the kind of yeoman work that Michael Sala does, or that Bill Tompkins has done regarding his career experiences, we'll have the positive synergy of people saying, this happened to me, and guess what? Here's my name on a briefing document from 1968 when I was dropped in DARPA's Project Pegasus. But let me emphasize something about this issue of evidence. Another, another point. I once had a discussion with Jim Mars about this question. He said, you know, Andy, and that wonderful t West Texas twang, we wish Jim the best uh, health-wise and everything today, you know, and recently. He said, we now have 80 plus Roswell cr crash witnesses. And you know something? I found in this field that if you believe the major premise that extraterrestrials came to this planet with all the advanced technology that that would require, and crashed in Roswell, New Mexico as a result of encountering radar, then you're gonna believe those 80, or at least many of those 80 Roswell crash witnesses. But if you don't believe that major premise that ETs visited us and crashed in July of 1947, you're going to question President Truman's signature on a briefing document, which is exactly what the MJ-12 investigation of uh, Honorable Terry Friedman, Stanton T. Friedman, led to. It's ultimately handwriting analysis of Truman's signature on, on the Majestic 12 documents. So I just want to emphasize that my bias as a lawyer and as an experiencer is testimonial. I've been talking about what happened to me. But I admit also 
the Honorable Richard Dolan's very valid point that, look, we can't just hang our beliefs based on statements, based on mere assertions. We also have to dig into the government records and also create sort of internal proofs within the assertions themselves that the people involved are giving voracious accounts of their experiences. So let me just say in, in closing, what I can say about the Mars Jump Room program is that I stand by the seven whistleblowers who have thus far come forward and described going to Mars via Jump Room. And those individuals, in my opinion, are Michael C. Ralph, Arthur Neumann, who was the Henry Deacon informant to Project Camelot, myself, my fellow jumper, William Brett Stillings, my dear friend Laura Eisenhower, who brought some very interesting testimonial evidence, which I'll describe in, in closing, um, and then Bernard Mendez and William White Crow, who was known as William Paris back when he was my martial arts instructor on Pegasus, and then I ran into him when he was serving as a U.S. Army guard on Mars in the 1982-83 time frame. Let's d let me just close with three very conspicuous points about this testimonial evidence, and, the, and, and I'll use it as an example to show how testimonial evidence can, can lead to ineluctable conclusions just based on logic. Let me share one that involves Laura Eisenhower. When Laura came forward and stated that she was uh, subjected to a recruitment campaign to go to Mars with her then two-year, her then two 10-year-old twin boys, Gavin and Garrick Eisenhower, who are certainly astronaut material, um, she stated to, in an interview to Alfred Lambermont Weber that she was told she was going to be going to Mars via ARC. And in her discussion of that, she thought, well, they're analogizing to Noah's ARC, and they're calling these space planes that are going to take us to Mars ARCs, A-R-K. In fact, I know because of my training and my project experiences in the CIA's Mars Jump Room program, right, that, that, the, uh, that the jump rooms, the technical term for the jump rooms was ARC, Aeronautical Repositioning Chamber. And just in closing, let me provide another lead that the testimonial evidence has led to, and that is William White Crow and I have provided not just very controversial evidence of taking a jump room to Mars many times, but the fact that in the 1982-83 time frame at the building in El Segundo, California, where the West Coast jump room was, we encountered a very famous American who was supposed to be dead already, and that was Howard Hughes. And recently, we, we've been doing interviews with Major General Mark Music and Douglas Wellman regarding their book, Boxes, The Secret Life of Howard Hughes, in which, to my satisfaction, they proved that Howard Hughes' death was faked in April of 1976 so that he could work on sensitive technical projects connected to the CIA, like the Glomar Explorer and the Mars Jump Room program, without the risk of assassination or abduction. And so our testimonial evidence links with the testimony and the documentary evidence they've gathered about Hughes surviving, not just into the 1980s, but indeed dying in the year 2001. So in the same way that a, a key FBI document or CIA memorandum or something can establish the historicity of claims like mine and Corey, Corey's and Randy Kramer's, the internal information itself can lead to proofs that when you apply the standard of evidence that the court of the court of law or the court of public opinion is applying, essentially proves the veracity and the historicity of the claims, such as I believe Laura's statement does. She had the technical term for the jump rooms and didn't even know it. So anyway, those are my opening points. And I see the okay. mic to <laughs> yes. uh, I wish Dr. We Michael had our, <laughs> Thank you very much. I wish we had all night, but uh, we are going to have to speed it up if we're going to get some of our great questions from the audience. Thank you. It's all very valuable. But we'll certainly get more from your upcoming uh, pr uh, presentation. Thank you so much. Dr. Sala, you've made some remarkable claims about the relationships between aliens and the various factions of Germany. Can you clarify why the Germans lost the war when they had the secret weapon that Hitler boasted about? What happened was that, uh, that the Germans had been doing this pioneering research into anti-gravity, uh, torsion field physics, and trying to at this at this while well, trying to understand that, also try to weaponize that technology. And those are very separate uh, scientific endeavors. And so that uh, while one branch of the German military, and in particular the German Navy, because the Navy were always in control of the German space program because the Navy were the ones that had the most experience in um, modular construction uh, techniques um, you know, during the Weimar Republic, 
uh, the German Navy was prohibited from building submarines, so they did uh, an, uh, an end play around that prohibition by basically uh, working uh, through German corporations, American corporations, uh, Dutch companies, uh, Spanish and other places to build the modular components of what would eventually be a, a new German submarine fleet. So the German Navy were the pioneers in this. They worked with the uh, uh, German secret societies, the Thule Society in particular, uh, the, the, the key German official running this uh, Navy program uh, was uh, uh, the uh, Admiral Canaris. Uh, he was a Thule Society member and so he uh, basically pulled together German scientists, military uh, people who could understand what would be needed for building this new German Navy. And along the way, they learned about things like anti-gravity, new energy physics, torsion field physics. And so they were experimenting with all of this. And eventually, by the time Hitler came to power in 33, uh, he then began a program through the SS to weaponize these technologies. But uh, uh, all the time, you had the German Navy working with uh, German secret societies to uh, build these technologies for outer space, um, deployment, uh, and uh, at the same time you had the, the SS trying to weaponize these. And so by as the war uh, began and, and, and towards the war's end, while they had success in building some of these craft for space flight, so you, you have actually the Gerbids during the Second World War building and successfully sending uh, anti-gravity craft from Antarctica into space, at the same time, the Nazi SS uh, weaponization program in Germany was collapsing because of the bombardment. Okay, very good. And uh, if you could answer in 30 seconds. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> Just summarize in a nutshell uh, how you see the evidence for governmental or non-governmental evidence for the secret space program, if it's real and, has and is ongoing. Just in a nutshell. Sure. Uh, well, I, I did this on Friday night when I presented on Bill Tompkins' testimony where there was a lot of documentation supporting uh, Bill's claims that the uh, U.S. Navy out of uh, Naval Air Station San Diego actually had uh, a, a covert espionage program to learn about what the Nazis were doing and that uh, in the 1950s uh, through... Uh, the documents that Bill has supplied from Douglas Aircraft Company and, uh, and other uh, companies that he worked with and what we can get from public domain, uh, there were a number of U.S. corporations that were working with the U.S. Navy in building these anti-gravity craft. All right, very good. Thank you, uh, Mr. Tompkins. So many years have passed since uh, your first exposure to UFOs, uh, as is true with a lot of people. How confident are you that all of your evidence that you've brought forward uh, is accurate uh, and is can be accurately regarded as evidence. Could I, could I uh, talk a little bit about blue sky stuff? Uh, answer it however you'd like. I can't tell you how to answer, but just be quick. Okay. <laughs> We're just on a little time frame, and these, these people out here will kill us all if they don't get their questions in at the end of the day. Okay. <laughs> Let me just talk a little, all right? Uh, in Douglas Aircraft... Uh, let, let, let me just say, keep an eye on me. If I'm smiling, it's okay. And if I'm frowning, you might want to wrap it up. Oh, smile. <laughs> okay, <laughs> come on. Uh, wait a minute, okay? Uh, I'm now an engineering section chief on the Apollo program. Uh, and actually... We had the S-4B contract, which is the engineering. It's the command center of all the Apollo missions. And uh, actually, NASA was involved. We had the uh, paper, paper clip people come in. But you guys don't understand, Douglas did all of this work four, five, six, seven years before NASA even existed. And so we have massive documents about going out into space, not just going to the moon. That was the first phase of an enormous program that Douglas had come up with with the, C the fellows in the secret think tank. So let me just say, uh, 
how did my secretary get involved, okay? I don't want to make it complicated. I don't want to try to sidestep it. Uh, could could we, word, uh, wait excuse, a minute. Excuse me, just, excuse me just a moment. If we could, uh, if we could focus on the, the secret space program and uh, w we'll just have to book you for a whole weekend because you have stories that we want, you know, that are great. Okay. But if we could just focus on how you view the evidence of the government's uh, All right. and I'm the non-governmental evidence I'm for the secret space there. program. I appreciate it. I know. There. Okay. <laughs> and you're precious. Back to my secretary. Okay, no no kidding. Wait a minute. We have in Douglas uh, meetings every single day on the Apollo program. And when we're, we're working together trying to come up with an answer of a major problem on the Apollo program, uh, my secretary puts it in my head and says, Bill, tell him certain, certain information. This was always the correct information. Now, I, can't, I cannot say that this didn't happen. This happened for four years with this young lady. So whether you believe that uh, Nordics have been helping us or not, I have to say, uh, every question that's going to be asked in this room today actually comes down to information that's given directly to us. Now, we have copies, hundreds of copies of documents which actually cover all of the Apollo program, the monies that were uh, presented for these programs. This is hundreds of documents verifying that we went to the moon, that we were also supposed to go on four, three major other programs in space. Uh, uh, you could say, okay, that's just some story that Bill Tompkins came up with. I'm sorry, it's all documented. All right, thank you very much. That was excellent. <laughs> Wasn't that excellent? <laughs> Corey, good. Most people have uh, trouble understanding, or maybe uh, some people uh, have trouble understanding the reality of time travel, time and age regression. Um, are there other kinds of evidence besides those like your own experiences that would support the reality of being able to travel in time? And, and then your quick view on the solidity of the evidence of governmental sources and non-governmental sources that a secret space program is real and ongoing. Sure. Of course, I'm basing a lot of my information off of what I'm calling my own personal experiences. Experiencers have testimony, and even though a lot of testimony is admissible in a court of law, some people find that the scientific method works better for them. And I think that People like us that have information that we don't have a whole lot of cooperation or documentation behind, we need to understand also that there are different personality types out there, different ways of approaching problems, left brain, right brain individuals. And each of us are, are going to look for different types of information to validate either our experiences or what we think is reality. So I think that each of these different personality types and left and brain, right brain type people need to, need to realize that and also realize that people that call themselves experiencers um, are heavily invested in getting to the truth, whatever that is as well. All right, thank you so much, Corey. And Richard Dolan, you've written so eloquently about many aspects of the secrecy of the UFO program. Do you think there's still some secrets yet to be uncovered to get the whole truth and is it possible even possible that some of your fellow panelists are close to getting some of the right answers and uh, then address your view of evidence of the secret space program. All right, well, I'll, I'll answer that, but I, I really want to respond to everything that's been said uh, up till now. Um, I have to. So uh, the main thing, I want to start with uh, Germany during the Weimar Republic, which is what Michael was talking about earlier. It is absolutely true that during the 1920s, after World War I, when Germany lost that war, their military was disbanded. And uh, it is also true that during that period, the German army and military did covertly work with other nations and outside sources to, 
to keep itself militarized. However, uh, I would suggest that is way overstated. Um, so they worked with the Russians during the early communist period, it's true. But even so, the German military was so weak during almost all of the 1930s, people have no idea. So when Hitler, for example, reoccupied the Rhineland in 1936, no one realized if France had budged, if France had done a thing, the German army would have been trounced in military combat with the French. They had no ability to withstand that. But it was Hitler's bluff that pulled it off and it won the day. My point is simply the German military was not in much of a condition. So, um, you know, with that said, you have to really ask yourself how realistically was a German, how could a German space program have existed? Yes, we know about the Vril Society. We know about the Tula Society. Um, where is their money? Where is their technology? Uh, where is this being siphoned out of the German economy, the German military budget? There's absolutely not one single shred of historical evidence has come to us to show that the Germans were spending money on this. They're based in Antarctica. Base, I use in quotes. Neue Schwabenland, yes. The Germans had an interest in Antarctica during the 1930s. We know this. But there is no, I repeat, no evidence that they established anything there other than dropping some, some swastika flags on the surface of Antarctica, which they did. Um, even the bird expedition of high jump, um, I challenge every single person here to answer me this. After the expedition supposedly ended in catastrophic military defeat at the hands of Nazi extraterrestrial combinations, why was it that less than one year later, in nearly the exact same region, the Americans sent yet another expedition there, which had no problem whatsoever. And then the year after that again. All right, so if the uh, Am Americans were chased out of Antarctica, why did they return immediately with no problem? These are questions I haven't heard anyone answer. Uh, relating to um, the claim of Draco's, uh, I respectfully say, respectfully say that um, this is uh, something that's not based on any te any evidence, any logic, and it is a, a purely sensationalist statement that I really have to question why uh, it's being discussed at a what I would say is a serious UFO conference, um, where what we're dealing with is is I have to say nothing more than the collection of the most dark, tawdry, sensationalist stories that have circulated in our culture over the last century, with it, which any outsider would say looks like a mishmash of everything that looked really cool and interesting and out there, and we've just g gathered it together and, and put out there and now stating as, as fact, fact that cannot be confirmed in any way whatsoever, even tested in one way or another. So I challenge why that's being discussed here. Um, and the last thing I would just say is, and I just want to respond to something Corey just said a moment ago, which is relating to truth and scientific truth and other kinds of truth. Um, truth is not a subjective thing, and truth doesn't care what your personality is. Truth is truth, and that's it. Um, it's not whether you're right brain or left brain. Uh, truth is what it is, and it's up to us to, um, to determine it and agree upon it. Uh, as, as to your question, Cheryl, I, I know I've talked a lot here, but um, you asked about uh, evidence for a secret space program. Is that right? Yes, that is real. I mean well, yeah, I mean, very simple. I, I wrote my own notes down here. It's, it's uh, I think, very straightforward. Um, a, you've got, first of all, it's, it's out in the open that the United States military has classified elements out in space. I mean, the NRO, the National Reconnaissance Office, is highly secret. They've got spy satellites. We all know that there's literally a secret space program that exists. That is not even a matter of argument. You can go on CNN or ABC and argue that and you'd have no problem defending it. Um, the question really is how advanced is this program? What are they doing? I argue, as, <coughs> as everyone else here, that is quite advanced. Um, there is a large amount of testimony from U.S. and Russian astronauts and cosmonauts, for example, for starters, of very anomalous objects that they've encountered in Earth orbit. Right. There's a lot of this, and we don't need to go over it all here. There's a great deal of good, um, in my opinion anyway, video evidence of anomalies in space as well. Uh, people can argue about them, fair enough, but I think there's enough that it's, it's, it's strong. Um, there is good 
testimony from known NASA insiders and uh, other individuals proven to be connected with the U.S. space program about nonstop rumors from the late 60s, early 70s about astronauts being followed by UFOs and encountering craft on the moon. This is not proven to be true, but it is, it is a fact that those rumors were widespread in NASA. So I think I make some inferences uh, based on that and other, other um, sources that make me think, yes, this is real. On top of that, you've got the entire history of testimony of UFO crash retrievals, testimony dealing with uh, attempts to replicate the technology through the so-called ARV, Alien Reproduction Vehicle, which uh, I credit that story, I think is a true story. Um, so we've got the motivation, that is anomalies in space, to investigate. We've got the um, means to study, that is retrieval of exotic technology, UFOs. And there's enough good evidence that we've been working on replicating them. And then you've got stories from NASA uh, talking about uh, encountering uh, bases and beings out in space. So to me, that's more than ample motivation for a highly secret space program. On top of that, you've got billions, maybe trillions of dollars of missing money through the financial black hole at the center of our global financial system. Uh, it's reasonable to ask, where's some of that money going? So all of it fits together. But to me, I, I would emphasize a lot of that is speculative. Um, I, I would have a hard time saying that I'm proving this, but I think it's a good, it's a good uh, conclusion to make provisionally. Okay, and speaking of evidence, and how do you how do you uh, marry the two evidence verifiable with oh. testimony? Yeah, Th and Andy talked about this, and this is a very good point. So um, this is a hard subject for us to study. I mean, UFOs intrinsically are difficult. It's very difficult. Uh, on top of that, we have government obfuscation and um, interference uh, that has happened. I think interference. So we're really at a disadvantage in uh, talking about this. And when uh, I, as a researcher, and other people here have um, encountered individuals who come to you privately. They uh, don't want to be publicly known. You get information and it's not always possible to verify it. That's a fact. It happens to me as well as anyone else. And I have to go on my judgment when I'm listening to somebody. There's always a gray area there. I, I never know 100% for sure if someone's truthful or not. But I will say this. Uh, so, so Andy's point, I, I really take it, which is that you've got documented evidence that you you can say, let's take this to the bank. I always keep that in a separate pile over here. And I always, I like to know what I know. I know that this is true. Then there's all of this other stuff that might be true, might be false. Um, some of it I think is probably true and some of it isn't. And, um, and so we have to, it's, it's a judgment game. You know, the one thing I, I go by though is I don't, I don't allow anything in this pile over here. If it absolutely contradicts something that I know then it's, it's not going to really get much, uh, you know, consideration from me. Uh, the other thing I just have to point out is that people do lie. People are delusional. It happens uh, in my life. I'm sure in the lives of many people here, we encounter individuals who uh, don't tell them the truth. And it's not that they're all liars. People don't tell the truth for all kinds of reasons. And I'm not the psychologist to figure it out, but that's the reality. So when someone tells you or me a story, I take it as a story and I make a little check note, and I think, okay, maybe this is true, and I'll look for corroboration. All right, very good. Thank you so much. Now, we're going to move very quickly, but I think uh, uh, Michael Sala has a point that he wants to make or possibly respond to, and he will do so very quickly. Yes, won't you, Michael? I do <laughs> want to respond to something Richard said, that, uh, that the German military was kind of uh, cash-starved and that there was no evidence of a secret space program that was being run uh, during uh, the Hitler uh, era. And I, I want to point out that that's fundamentally incorrect. Uh, we know this. It's a fact. Uh, Albert Speer was the German war minister for armaments. He knew all about the German armaments program. And he was complaining that in the midst of him uh, uh, acquiring all of the necessary resources to be basically be able to fund Hitler's war, and at the same time, uh, Himmler's SS had set up a parallel military industrial complex where he had no access to what the Nazi SS were building. And, and in his book, um, he wrote a number of books, in his book, it's not well known, it's called Infiltration, he lays out what the Nazi SS had planned um, uh, subsequent to the war where they would actually build 
uh, a slave empire around the world using slave labour uh, to basically continue these advanced projects. But Speer, I think in writing Infiltration, he was actually alluding to this uh, Nazi SS space program out of Antarctica without directly saying it. But when you read the book Infiltration, it is pretty clear to me that he is actually affirming that there was this parallel military industrial complex run by the Nazi SS that was predicated on slave labor and that it continued. Yeah, all of that is true. Speer did write this. I'm aware of this as well, Michael. It's totally true. Uh, whether he's implying a, about a secret space program, I think is highly tendentious and I, I, I would uh, again, ask for any evidence that the, the Germans, the Nazis, were developing any, anything other than uh, plans. Um, the, the Germans were interested in very non-conventional physics. No question about it. Uh, the, the real question we have to ask is how far do they go with it? And, uh, you know, we've got stories of de Glock, de Bell, and other types of uh, breakthroughs that were allegedly made, but what even the Bell story is nothing other than some testimony in a trial a few years after the war. We don't really know. Uh, we don't know how operationally, the Schauberger disc, another question, how operational was it? Um, so I, I would question that. All right, very, very quickly. I, I would like to, uh, I'd like to get into freedom of information. Uh, Dr. Michael Salas has an unbelievable program where virtually everything that I have said to him, he doesn't believe. So he has gone to freedom of information. These documents that he has, and he has many more of them, that confirm exactly what it was that took place. And I don't think that you folks give uh, Michael Salas the credit for, the, for this penetration, because this is staggering. He finds out what really happened, and it turns out some of my stuff was correct. Well, I think, uh, I think, um, I think that's why uh, Jan has designed this conference in the format that he's designed it in, so that everybody with a diverse opinion can come to the table and in an open uh, environment very freely express their views and present their viewpoints. And it's kind of like uh, we're in a big blender here. We'll put it all in there, we'll blend it up, and we'll see what comes out. And who knows, uh, very few people on the planet can actually say they know everything to be accurate and honest across the board, but, but the only way we're going to get to the truth is to discuss it and take the uh, good, the bad, and the ugly and let it be debated and understood and questioned. And we appreciate all of your information and in coming forward to help us do that. So with that, why don't we go ahead and uh, start with uh, some questions. We, uh, we would want you to come up. You might just go ahead and form a line here, and uh, then we'll, we'll get on with the show. <coughs> and I think uh, we're going to have some great questions, and we're going to have some fabulous answers. <coughs> and again, in the interest of time, uh, we are looking at right now um, just about th mm, 25 more minutes, so let's be to the point. Joe. Thanks. You, you might remember me as the uh, moderator of the citizens' hearing. I'm currently running for Congress in Utah in the special election, calling for whistleblower protection and in congressional hearings, as I did back in 2008 as well when I ran then. Um, Richard, this question is for you. You were at the citizens' hearing. Um, I thought one of the most interesting statements there was made by Mike Rebell who um, dismissively, as most of his comments were, <laughs> said that there was an active secret space program, U.S. space program, that he'd been briefed on apparently as a, as a senator. And that would have been in 1972, so 45 years earlier. Um, when do you think that part of a secret space program may have be began? And what do you think members of Congress are actually um, <coughs> briefed on, you know, that he might have known uh, that early, if you have any documentary evidence of that. And then since I've got the mic, uh, it's www.gotol, which stands for liberty, dot vote if you'd like to check out my campaign. I have to take advantage. Thanks for clarifying what Th that meant. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Joe Buckman. <laughs> vote for Joe. There's no uh, screening here, by the way. Just like in so television, you know, that seven-second delay, we don't I have that. So I'm going so to... Uh, just L. I'm going <laughs> to... <coughs> 
I'm going to try to be efficient with this, and I'm, I'm sure other people here would love to have had that question asked of them. But I'll do my best. Um, I think that the um, likely uh, secret space program de developed probably right along with the beginning of the NASA program, or as some might hear, say even earlier, I don't know. Um, I'm only speculating. Look, as I said earlier, the U.S. military uh, clearly has secret elements of their, uh, of their presence in space.